Je vous remercie, Herr Christoph, euh, et l'Académie euh, des sciences, des lettres et des beaux-arts de Belgique euh, de m'avoir invité à ce colloque et de vous tout le monde euh, pour être ici. Shakespeare est quatre siècles d'une été éternelle. Et en plus, Shakespeare au tournant du 21e siècle. C'est un sujet énorme. On a, aurait besoin du pouvoir surhumain pour euh, saisir cet ouvrage herculéen. Je vous parler euh, ce matin euh, du pouvoir des personnages féminins. Euh, le pouvoir, c'est évident, mais la gloire, c'est peut-être loin d'être aussi clair euh, que nous l'imaginer. Comme Christophe well, n'a pas dit, mais euh, j'ai écrit la conférence en anglais. Mais hier soir, euh, j'ai traduit quelques euh, mots, <rire> l'argument principal en français. Et j'ai écrit euh, en français quelques points de balle. On dit points de balle Oui. Euh, dans la présentation euh, PowerPoint, ici. Euh, alors... Mais j'ai laissé Shakespeare à lui-même en anglais. Euh, au fin de Henry V, le roi cotise Catherine, euh, la princesse de France, et lui dit « J'espère, entre nous, euh, euh, qu'on on va parler tous les deux. I shall never move thee in French. » unless it be to laugh at me. Catherine, sauf votre honneur, le François que vous parlez, il est meilleur que l'anglois que lequel je parle. No faith, it is not, Kate, but thy speaking of my tongue, and I thine, most truly falsely, must needs be granted to be much at one. J'espère alors que entre nous, uh, la conférence travaillera. Comme vous euh, avez déjà euh, sans doute euh, remarqué, euh, j'ai emprunté euh, ma titre de notre père, euh, mais il y a un mot qui manque. Euh, en anglais, euh, le, les mots « for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory », le mot qui mot, euh, c'est le royaume, the kingdom. Les personnages féminins à Shakespeare, euh, ils n'ont pas de royaume. Euh, même s'il y avait beaucoup de reines euh, au pouvoir à travers l'Europe, quand Shakespeare écrivait. J'utilise les idées, les idées de Giorgio Agamben. C'est un philosophe italien euh, qui est très populaire euh, à ce moment au savon de Shakespeare. Euh, et je, je utilise ses idées pour examiner la, la gloire. Je voudrais examiner comment la gloire euh, est une qualité essentielle pour créer et maintenir le pouvoir euh, que les personnages féminins de Shakespeare, ou Joan la Pucelle, Jeanne d'Arc, euh, Margaret of Anjou, euh, la reine de Henry IV, the, the Henri IV, en, en anglais, euh, et aussi euh, Cléopâtre, euh, les trois, euh, comment il, il, il comprend bien sa fonction, la fonction de la gloire politique, la fon sa fonction politique. Quand il représente euh, le parole euh, et leur action, Shakespeare nous donne, euh, nous donne pardon, une vision euh, critique, je crois, euh, de la souveraineté et de son évolution euh, au VIe siècle et peut-être et à 20e, 21e siècle en plus. Alors, la première partie, 
ce sera la souveraineté. J'ai dit ça bien Souveraineté. 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 Merci, Christophe. La souveraineté. Une rupture de souveraineté travaillée à travers l'Europe euh, au VIe siècle, principalement à cause de la réforme. Comme Paul Kleber Monod, euh, un, astro, euh, un historien, euh, a, a fait valoir. L'autorité absolue créée par leur, euh, la règle du droit divin et de la sacralité euh, du monarque a été remplacée par une prise de conscience que la souveraineté est un fait, un paradoxe. Les définitions du dictionnaire sont utiles, utiles pour expliquer les deux aspects contradictoires de la souveraineté. Alors, oh, pardon. La condition d'être souverain, c'est d'abord celui qui euh, a la suprématie et le rang au-dessus euh, ou autorité sur les autres souvent appliqué à Dieu, euh, la seconde précise la règle suprême reconnue d'un peuple ou d'un pays sous la gouvernement monarchique, un roi, une reine ou un mari sur sa femme. Hum. Euh, une, une utilisation, la, 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 la dernière, obsolète, on dit. Euh, les définitions aligner les contextes théologiques et politiques. Dans un contexte personnel, c'est la dernière, voilà. euh, dans un contexte personnel, la souveraineté signifie euh, la même idée de la super supériorité d'être exceptionnel, supérieur aux autres. Alors, être souverain, et d'être euh, auto-ordinateur comme euh, Richard of Gloucester, Richard III. Euh, « I am myself alone », il dit. Bien que Shakespeare écrit euh, 50 ans avant de Descartes, il est évident que cette idée et la définition de soi, euh, l'autodétermination, sont euh, en train d'émerger dans le VIe siècle pour les hommes et pour les femmes. Cela euh, crée une contradiction fondamentale dans la souveraineté. Souveraineté, pardon. Il exige l'obéissance absolue à un, un pouvoir suprême exceptionnel à partir d'une société d'individus euh, qui sont le même, qui sont exceptionnels. Uh, à Henry VI, part 2, um, the Earl of Suffolk, uh, d'envoi uh, au mécontentement que cela pourrait produire uh, dans une, 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 uh, la société dans une monarchie euh, où all the peers and nobles of the realm et toute la population, la souveraineté est un paradoxe. They have been as bondmen to thy sovereignty. Alors la, la, la souveraineté est un paradoxe politique parce que pour être souverain, à être absolument autonome, autorontisé soi-même, Tandis que, simultanément, euh, l'institution euh, de l'État exige l'obéissance absolue à un pouvoir suprême exceptionnel. À Gambon, il euh, valoir euh, que la gloire est une colle. Il dit une colle qui tient le paradoxe de la souveraineté dans un, dans un tout, 
euh, ensemble et permettent au monarque de conserver le pouvoir absolu. Alors, il dit ici, « Why does power, » il demande, « Why does power need glory ?» If power is essentially force and capacity for action and government, he continues, why does it assume the rigid form of ceremonies, rituals and protocols? Son livre propose que la gloire ou uh, l'affichage spectaculaire uh, de la souveraineté suprême est un compliment uh, indispensable à la force et à la volonté de l'action parce qu'il est il verrouille, verrouille ensemble il, comme ça euh, les deux parts euh, les deux forces euh, potentiellement euh, explosives de la souveraineté en regardant la gloire euh, des souverains les sujets font confiance à un principe d'autonomie suprême, le même, qui euh, les lit simultan simultanément, j'ai difficile, <rire> j'ai des problèmes avec ce mot, <rire> simultanément, euh, et paradoxalement, euh, à obéir à cette règle suprême. Pour mon autre, explique que la gloire est devenue la caractéristique déterminante du monarchie euh, dans la Renaissance. Il dit ici, uh, « The Renaissance king became a classical god, a supernatural hero, or the subject of elaborate allegories with layers of disguised meaning. » garbed in such elaborate costumes, glowing even brighter to the educated few, the dazzling body of the king was further removed from the shadow of the Pope. But the monarch was also further separated from his subjects. Et on dit, on voit ici, uh, Elizabeth I, Um, elle est vêtue ici dans un éclat glorieux uh, qui est tient au travers la royaume. Uh, tu vois la royaume uh, au-dessus de, de ses pieds. Uh, elle, démontre, uh, elle démontre que les reines ainsi que les rois pourraient explo exploiter la puissance de la gloire de réinventer la souveraineté dans une nouvelle forme éblouissante. Le livre de Olivier de Marché, euh, de la montée et la chute des monarques, euh, qui, qui s'appelle euh, « The Resolved Gentleman », Um, it's a kind of chronicle history, dream vision, and a long poem like Spencer's The Fairy Queen um, put together. Um, ça décrit la grandeur de la reine Elisabeth comme ça. So excellent a daughter, and so highly of the heavens blessed, that besides the glorifying of the frozen poles and the fiery equinocticals of the tropes, with her invincible arms, such shall be the world's wonder and the admiration of her virtue, that the greatest kings, princes, and estates of the world shall think it the greatest happiness that may befall them, to be shrouded under the fair spreading wings of her imperious government, some of them falling down at her sacred feet, flying into her realm for refuge. Le livre euh, des voyages de Hauklet euh, cite encore une lettre de sultan euh, euh, à Elisabeth qui utilise le même style hyperbolique. Il a dit... Oh, non. Il a dit... Euh, je, je dois lire. Euh, 
In greatness and glory, most renowned Elizabeth, most sacred queen, and most noble prince of the most mighty worshippers of Jesus, the wise governor of the causes and affairs of the people and family of Nazareth, cloud of most pleasant rain and sweetest fountain of nobleness and virtue, um, heir and lady of perpetual happiness and glory, la gloire, of the noble realm of England, whom all sorts seek unto and submit themselves. Toi alors c'est très hyperbolique. Ce climat dans lequel euh, euh, le, la culture de la souveraineté euh, est en train de changer euh, et quand euh, la reine Gloria de la reine Elisabeth arrive à la fin en Angleterre, fournit une intertexte une intert résonante pour les pièces de Shakespeare. Une rupture euh, de la souveraineté est mise en scène dans la première tétralogie de Shakespeare. Ces quatre pièces qui, qu il dramatise, où il dramatise l'histoire des guerres de Rose. Voilà euh, une peinture euh, des guerres de Rose euh, de Henry VI, part 1. Les deux familles euh, sont mises en scène dans les pièces. Les deux familles. Au commencement, de Henry VI, part 1, um, nous avons uh, la, la maison royale de, de, de Lancaster et la maison royale de York. C'est la rose blanche et la rose rouge. Moi, je, euh, 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 je suis professeuse à Lancaster, mais j'étais née à Yorkshire. Alors, c'est assez difficile. <rire> et chaque, chaque année, il y a un grand... Euh, équipe de sport euh, qui euh, rejoue euh, les guerres de rose euh, chaque, chaque année à, à Lancaster. Alors, alors un, un peu d'histoire anglaise. Euh, les deux familles sont les, les, les enfants, si, 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 tu veux, euh, de, si vous voulez, de, de Edward III, la, euh, le roi, et le, les... Euh, au commencement de Henry VI, part 1, euh, nous avons euh, Henri euh, le VIe, Henry VI. Euh, C'est le fils de Henri V, le héros d'Azincourt, et le, un grand rat euh, guerrier. C'est lui, Henri VI, euh, qui est sur le, le trône. La France est les personnages féminins de la France sont partis de cette histoire. Margaret euh, d'Anjou, Marguerite d'Anjou, euh, est une des femmes euh, les plus puissantes de Shakespeare, apparaissant euh, dans toutes les quatre pièces. Henry VI, part 1, Henry VI, part 2, Henry VI, part 3, et Richard III. Mais, c'est, oh, voilà le, yeah. ça c'est euh, Henri VI, voici, et Margot Anjou. Et ils ont un fils, euh, la prince Edward, qui, qui apparaît euh, dans la pièce aussi. C'est Jean euh, la Pousselle, Jean d'Arc, qui est le personnage la plus étincelante de Henry VI, part 1. Le nom de jaune, Poussel, est une plaisanterie chez les Anglais. Poussel, en français, euh, vieille, euh, dit aux, aux oreilles anglais, puzzle, putain. Alors, euh, il y a beaucoup de, de euh, gestes comme, comme ça. La pièce lui présente de façon ambiguë. Elle est putain et aussi glorieuse vierge. Alors maintenant, euh, je vais euh, passer au texte écrit, euh, celui de Shakespeare et celui que j'ai déjà écrit, euh, et je vous parlerai en anglais. Si vous avez des questions, euh, s'il vous plaît, me demandez comme ça, d'arrêter, 
et j'essayais d'expliquer en français. At the opening, at the beginning, au commencement, uh, de Henry VI, part one, Bedford celebrates the memory of the glory of Henry V. He says, England hung be the heavens with black. Henry V, too famous to live long. England ne'er lost a king of so much worth. He says, his brandished sword did blind men with his beams. His arms spread wider than a dragon's wings. But that glory or credit which dazzles men's eyes is fleeting. It, it doesn't last. Joan La Pucelle, effective leader of the French, pertinently observes... Glory is like a circle in the water, which never ceaseth to enlarge itself, till by broad spreading it dispersed to naught. With Henry's death, the English circle ends. Glory can only perpetuate itself by constant renewal. Its disappearance puts government at risk, because, as we have heard, power needs glory. Under Henry VI, the institution of sovereignty breaks down because in spite of his humble piety, the absence of glory divides the kingdom and transfers power and its charisma onto competing subjects, men and women. Winchester, York, Somerset, Suffolk and Joan La Pucelle, Margaret of Anjou and the Duchess of Gloucester and ultimately Richard of Gloucester later Richard III, um, uh, joué uh, 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 par uh, Benedict Cumberbatch dans une, une télévision exposée uh, en Angleterre, um, are the embodiments of self-authorizing and self-founding autonomy. Arguably, Shakespeare's representation of Henry VI as a Christ-like son of a very powerful father radically exposes the insufficiency of the model of Christianity with Christ as a tending, caring shepherd and the model um, of divine sovereignty based on that in post-Reformation England. Henry VI's reign deconstructs the powerful sovereignty, a trinity of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost as a model of kingly authority. Henry's divine appointment and close study of his prayer book gives him no kingdom and no power because he has no glory. Into this space move female sovereign figures. Shakespeare depicts the glory of sovereignty through French women, Joan La Pucelle, the Countess of Auvergne, and Margaret of Anjou, who is in turn an inspiring, self-fashioning sovereign amongst the English women, as seen in figures like the Duchess of Gloucester and Elizabeth Grey. So Joan de Pucelle, to begin with, oh, here is, okay. Joan de Pucelle is converted from a black and swart peasant to a blessed beauty Francis Saint by the glorification of the Virgin Mary. And Mary's glory reflects on Joan. God's mother deigned to appear me and in a vision full of majesty willed me to leave my base vocation and free my country from calamity. Her aid she promised and assured success. In complete glory she revealed herself. As the champion of France Joan combines the traditional masculine militarism and the deft Machiavellian strategy. Armed with a sword, supposedly given to her by St. Catherine, she can take on the English hero, warrior hero, Talbot, and make his thoughts whirl like a potter's wheel. Her superior swordsmanship so surprises him that he anxiously denies it, demonizing her as a witch 
who, who rules, governs the English, turns the English soldiers into sheep um, by fear, not force. Joan is literally a glorious beacon of French nationalism. She bids the French soldiers um, run she, uh, um, victoriously. She flies the French colours from the walls of Orléans. Joan is much more impressive as a strategist as well, however. When the soldier Talbot takes huge whis risks to win glory um, for his sovereign in memory of Henry V, Joan La Pucelle recovers Rouen uh, from the English by means of a strategic disguise which unsettles the hierarchies of both gender and rank. In um, Act 3, Scene 2, she leads the French soldiers inside the city walls disguised as peasants, les pauvres gens de France. Of course, Joan herself is a peasant, or at least a shepherd's daughter. So by pre-kindling that idea of the, the revolution that lies underneath her triumphant ascent to the walls of Rouen, where she thrusts out a beacon and says, behold, this is the happy wedding torch that joineth Rouen to her countrymen. Talbot is horrified, the soldier, and he will not speak with her. Base muleteers of France, he says, like peasant footboys, do keep the walls and dare not take up arms like gentlemen. When Rouen is lost to the English again, Alençon and the Bastard of Ordillens appeal to Joan's Machiavellian skills, asking her to search out thy wit for secret policies. And it's this which will now glorify her and make her reverenced like a blessed saint. Joan uses patriotic rhetoric with deliberate use of maternal imagery and emotional appeal um, to persuade Burgundy to change allegiance and come back to his mother country, to France. Many critics have noticed similarities between Joan's hybrid strategy of fighting and of um, rhetoric, of, of um, powerful speeches, and that of Queen Elizabeth I. Um, her appearance, um, Queen Elizabeth's appearance in armor at Tilbury to fight off the Spanish Armada, combined with her brilliant use of diplomatic rhetoric to maintain England's and her own independent sovereignty. The biblical figure of Deborah is used by both women as part of their iconography. Um, and critics such as Susan Fry, Michael Dobson, and Nicola Watson have all argued that Joan's demonization in the play is a symptom of the animosity felt by Shakespeare and his co-writers towards Elizabeth in the latter stages of her reign. There is no doubt that Joan's failed attempt to summon spirits um, her denial of her father and her claimed pregnancy to save her life um, do rob her of the glory and the charisma that she enjoyed earlier in the play. As Ben Spiller has pointed out, however, the lines between English and French in the play are very blurred. And audiences are given the opportunity to celebrate or commiserate the dominance of a female warrior over her male counterparts. And that's the quotation that I've put up, up there. The celebration of a new model of sovereignty, which encompasses strategy, rhetoric, performance, spectacle, and a democracy based on individual agency, even that of a woman, emerges in the early part of the play. Meanwhile, the masculine military model of unified sovereignty, symbolized by Henry V and embodied by the soldier Talbot, dies, and any chance of its future revival is brutally eclipsed in the death of Talbot's son, John Talbot, the young man who comes onto the battlefield. Indeed, as the play makes clear, it is sacrificed to the competitive individualism of the nobles, especially York and Somerset, the two rivals in the Wars of the Roses. 
Joan's appropriation of the power and the glory is threatening. And at the end of the play, the English and the French unite in their wish to burn her. So as Spillers explains, she is the ultimate scapegoat for insecure men, no matter what their nationality. It's not just on gender terms, because she is a woman, that Joan threatens. She represents that subversive side of sovereignty as absolute autonomy that has the power to pull apart the institution of sovereign rule, where the monarch did blind men with his beams. And her final words leave that curse explicitly with the English. She says to them, May never glorious sun reflect his be reflects his beams upon the country where you make abode, but darkness and the gloomy shade of death environ you till mischief and despair drive you to break your necks or hang yourselves. From the beginning of this tetralogy and throughout Shakespeare's work, it's clear that a hybrid model of sovereignty, which is othered as both feminine and French, is actually part of the English national identity and government. Whatever we may think about Brexit, it's not true. <laughs> we are together. <laughs> Roland Cotterill, a very good critic, has deftly argued that the structural role of France has, thought to be, has to be thought about um, both in terms of a wound and a support. So France acts as a wound and France acts as a support. It's a supplement and it is in danger of supplanting um, the English in Shakespeare's English history plays. Joan's curse travels from France to England quite literally in the person of Margaret d'Anjou. At one rank further down, there's another character, the Countess of Auvergne, um, whose desire for personal power and revenge um, on Talbot and to save French sovereignty. Um, she she pin, uh, gets hold of a picture of Talbot and um, pierces it so that she's acting like a witch. She uses witchcraft. That gets translated into the English Countess of Gloucester's ambition for the crown in Henry VI, part two. So, this is the, the Countess of Auvergne, bewitches Talbot. The Duchess of Gloucester actually wants the crown herself. Um, and this is the Edward the Confessor's throne in Westminster Abbey. This is what she's imagining here. So, she says, um, Methought I sat in seat of majesty. This is a countess. This is not a queen. Um, in the cathedral church of Westminster, and in the chair where kings and queens are crowned, where Dame Henry and Dame Margaret kneeled to me, and on my head did set the diadem. This is a dream that she's recounting to her husband at this point. Unlike the dutiful subjects who see their own desires for absolute autonomy reflected and embodied by the ruling monarch, Eleanor places herself at the center of this scene of glory in the chair where kings and queens are crowned. The current king and queen crown her in this dream. Her husband doesn't even seem to be present. So like Richard III, Eleanor thinks, I am myself alone. She cannot stand anybody else on the scene. She cannot stand competition. Um, and we see this in a battle that goes on in the play between the two queens um, over a fan, where we have the, I'll go to the, uh, this is the, the text in which, uh, what's the word for a fan in French? Thank you. Yeah, so there's this battle going, going on over the fans in the play. And um, the, uh, the two queens, the king tries to intervene between the two queens, um, but cannot pacify them. And they end up enraged with each other throughout. And this um, causes not Hergé, but um, it is the La Ligne Claire, 
uh, La Ligne Claire. Um, this is a, by a friend of mine called Jack Fallows, another cartoonist, um, who has drawn me a nice picture of, of the two queens in, in battle there with the fans. So, more than any other French figure, um, the French queen, Margaret of Anjou, who we have here, is both wound and support, supplement and supplanter of the English monarchy personified by Henry VI. She wounds English territorial holdings in France since her jointure uh, in the territories of Maine and Anjou um, is lost. This is what she, she has to give away. And she brings absolutely no dowry with her to her marriage to Henry. In fact, she strips England of glory in contrast to another arranged match between Henry and the Earl of Armagnac's daughter, which would have bought French allegiance and French wealth. So at the conclusion of Henry VI, part one, King Henry's one act of sovereign will, the one thing that he does to be independent in the play, um, he determines to marry Margaret of Anjou and break off this much better match is disastrous. And in fact, it's hollow, since the Earl of Suffolk and Margaret of Anjou are undoubtedly in love and together, but they determine that they're going to rule, well, Suffolk says he's going to rule Queen Margaret and the king and the kingdom. Although Margaret of Anjou and Suffolk are undoubtedly in love and they succeed together in plotting to seize government from um, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, the protector of the realm, it's clear from the play that Margaret is not simply Suffolk's puppet. She makes her mind very clear when he captures her. And she's his prisoner, but she says to him, to be a queen in bondage is more vile than is a slave in base servility, for princes should be free. These lines echo Elizabeth I's sentiments and Elizabeth I's masculine self-definition. Elizabeth always signed her letters um, as a prince, uh, the great prince Elizabeth, um, in her correspondence. And she called Mary, Queen of Scots, princess all the way through to devalue her claim to legitimacy. In Henry VI parts two and three, Suffolk's death and Henry VI's retreat to pastoral contemplation actually makes Margaret the custodian of the power and glory of the Lancastrian monarchy. And we have threats to Henry's rule from the Yorkists, um, from the Duke of York, Richard Duke of York, um, and from um, his, his confederates. Um, his three sons in particular. When, um, at the beginning of Henry VI, part three, um, we get a scene in which there are two kings and only one throne. Um, the, the throne is on, it's a, it, the scene is set in Westminster, but um, we have Richard, Duke of York, sitting on the throne and Henry without a throne at that point. And... Queen Margaret is infuriated by this and rouses the army um, to get rid of York. So she makes, in the battle, um, she makes Richard of York sit on a molehill and she gets hold of the image of sovereignty and then tries to make it um, pass over that degraded image of, of monarchy to York instead of it being with her husband, Henry. So she gives York a paper crown, and she puts the crown on his head, sitting on this molehill. Um, a crown for York, and lords bow low to him. Hold you his hands whilst I do set it on. I marry, sir, now looks he like a king. And this is he took King Henry's chair. So that's revenge on Joan's part off with his crown, and with the crown, his head. However, York takes up this challenge, and he turns the devaluation of kingship and monarchy back onto Joan again in this next um, slide. What he does is to insult 
um, Queen Margaret um, by reminding her that her father's title as King of Naples, Sicil, and Jerusalem is a very empty title. Um, he says that, in fact, Margaret's father is a poor monarch who bears the title of the King of Naples, and yet is not so wealthy as an English yeoman. So he's very, very much degrading her at that point. And that latter line recalls and implicitly feminizes and delegitimizes the transgressions of rank by other characters in the play. Most prominently, this figure, Jack Cade, who's a kind of, I suppose, Brexit lunatic um, in the text, um, who sets up a kind of Republican revolution uh, in England. Significantly, Margaret must return to France in order to regain her majesty and her power from the support of King Louis and the Earl of Warwick. And she adopts the role of helmswoman to steer the Lancastrian ship of state, while her son, Prince Edward, is praised as the reincarnation of Henry V, who will live long to bear his image and renew his glories. So all the hope is placed in the sun with this revival of sovereignty. But Edward does not live long. Um, he's murdered brutally by the Yorkist family. And Margaret, at that point, um, collapses. She loses her power, but she is kept alive and weirdly comes back in the play of Richard III, totally unhistorically. She doesn't appear, she came back to France, but Shakespeare has her in the English court in Richard III. And there, she is paradoxically the immortal bard of Tudor history. Her presence at the heart of England in Richard III is a kind of choric role. She acts as a chorus in the play. Um, there's no stage direction to mark her entrance in Act 1, Scene 3, so she appears as a kind of ghost, a ghost of France that is always still there in England. As a monument without a tomb, she offers an ironic commentary on male attempts to reclaim sovereignty. Richard of Gloucester, later Richard III, speaks for all the characters on stage and for the memories and the longings of Tudor spectators when he claims... I do but dream on sovereignty. I'm going to go. There we are. Okay. I do but dream on sovereignty like one that stands upon a promontory and spies a far off shore where he would tread. So sovereignty has disappeared and that shore is not reached until the very end of Richard III when Richmond claims the glory of victory and legitimate success succession by marrying Elizabeth of York, who's the grandmother to Elizabeth I that's on the throne. And that's in that Tudor to marriage on that slide there. Okay. While Edward IV's very English Queen Elizabeth negotiates the Tudor match and outwits Richard III, Margaret, the French character, assembles a female anti-chorus that simultaneously critiques and it inspires the, uh, the other women and other characters, I think, of female primacy in English sovereignty. She talks about its imminent loss in terms of the Elizabethan present, the, the soon-to-be death of Elizabeth I. But at the same time, um, she talks about the loss of sovereignty as a whole. Margaret has a remarkable 38-line speech to Queen Elizabeth, um, her successor, her, her Yorkist successor. Um, and it's, it offers an alternative chronicle of the Wars of the Roses, focused on their mirrored lives, um, their mirrored lives as queens, which blends personal anger. So here, is, here are some sections of it. I'm not going to read them because we have running out of time. Um, but these... These are some little extracts um, from them, some key lines. To play the part of a painted queen, Margaret argues, is to continue that history where women are excluded um, and to that history of a false monarchy. To be merely the flattering index of a direful pageant 
in which women are the garish flags of themselves. They're without dignity. Glory without power cannot make a kingdom for women. A woman is always a queen in jest, only to fill the scene. Farewell, sweet York's wife, and queen of sad mischance, she ends up. These English woes will make me smile in France. Again, a kind of resonant line at the moment, I feel. Margaret's parting lines thus superficially deport the loss of full sovereignty beyond the shores of Tudor England to France. However, the insecurities of monarchy, um, everything that we've been talking about in the early modern period, is in fact part of the English scene. In a competitive world of self-interest and ambition, every sovereign subject is only a dream of what thou art, wert, a breath, a bubble. Margaret of Anjou personifies the structural role of France as a thorn in the English side, if you like, that reminds the English what cannot be dislodged, that knowledge. As a wound and support, as supplement and supplanter, her words remind English spectators that Tudor monarchy and sovereignty itself are never fully present. They're never restored. They belong to an older medieval world, um, which is, remains as a ghost, and, and spectators are now haunted by that thought of what thou wert, to torture thee the more being what thou art. Arguably, that condition of lack referred to in those lines is one which women are culturally conditioned to manage through centuries of performing the glorious illusion of power um, in the knowledge of its absence in their own lives. And whereas the conclusion of Henry the, Richard III dismally advertises the emptiness of glory at the end of Elizabeth's reign, Antony and Cleopatra strikes a defiant note for its efficacy from within a very different regime when James I is on the throne, where we have patriarchal sovereignty and absolutism, um, complete patriarchal absolutism inaugurated by James I. Cleopatra conjures glory by using language and spectacle to transform her status as a disempowered colonized subject into that of a transcendent mythical empress. The fact that she too is identified with witchcraft, Pompey says, let witchcraft join with beauty, lust with both, testifies to women's particular understanding of how glory works, in contrast to male negative definitions of glory as a kind of magic. Cleopatra employs the techniques identified by Carl Schmidt and Giorgio Agamben to conjure glory. Her rule over the population of Egypt is founded on the efficacy of acclamation. She wittily exposes the impotence of military conquest by refusing to meet the conquering Antony in the marketplace, in the streets. Um, instead, she goes and sits on her barge on the banks of uh, the River Nile. And we hear from Enobarbus, the city cast her people out upon her, and Antony, enthroned in the marketplace, did sit alone, whistling to the air, which but for vac vacancy had gone to gaze on Cleopatra too, and made a gap in nature. That's a perfect example of Agamben's analysis of how democratic sovereignty works. The people are excited by watching Cleopatra's barge. Their visual, their oral, their olfactory, and their tactile senses resonate empathetically with the glory that they see represented before them. And they're seduced by that image of sovereignty. The enthroned Antony, meanwhile, is without audience or acclaim in spite of commanding the full military force of the Roman conquering army. That imminent breach of logic, a gap in nature, is also a gap in sovereignty. Power without glory is just as illusory as the extravagant spectacle which has no substance in military might. And in that focus on media, on spin, I think we do have a familiar feel in the 21st century in the society of the spectacle. 
And I would propose that the shape-shifting Cleopatra of infinite variety is arguably the personification of Shakespeare au tournant du XXIe siècle, not of an age, but for all time, including the society of the spectacle which we inhabit. It's in um, Cleopatra's death scene, her suicide, that this, this comes to the fore most prominently. Although she's subject to the uh, Rome, Roman, the Roman conquerors, she's you know, part of a, a, an occupied territory, and she's the object of male passion, Cleopatra represents herself as a consuming subject um, by imitating Isis, the Egyptian goddess of resurrection, whose written name betokened the power of the throne. It's very much associated with the Egyptian throne. So the detail of Cleopatra in the habiliments of the goddess Isis draws in shape from Shakespeare on a much more extensive description in Plutarch's Lives, which was Shakespeare's source for the play. Which Plutarch says that Cleopatra appeared as a new Isis, and at all of the times else when she came abroad, suggesting a costume style for the Egyptian queen that would have created a three-dimensional kind of performance poetry, I think. Plutarch's account of how Isis and her murdered brother, Osiris, whose limbs Isis went into the river Nile and recovered and then brought him back to life, comments on the significance of Isis's robes. Plutarch says that their different tinctures and colors reflect her infinite variety to wit, light, darkness, day, night, fire, water, life, death, beginning and end, all in one costume, quite impressive. Their glory has the power to resurrect the serpent of old Nile, who's wrinkled deep in time. So Cleopatra, like her predecessor, has the power to dismember and remember male subjects. Her face draws Pompey's eyes to anchor his aspect and die with looking on her life. She imitates the supernatural goddess Isis in order to remember Antony, literally put his body back together in mythic terms. And Cleopatra's love poetry of mourning makes Antony exceptional. Um, his like a blaze on his face is like the heavens, his eyes are like the sun and moon, like those descriptions of Elizabeth I. Cleopatra's suicide. Oh, sorry. Um, what's happened here? There we go. Cleopatra's suicide, um, where she asks her women, Charmian here, to bring on her best attires and show her like a queen and get her to bring the asp, the worm of Nile that brings liberty, invests her with all that regenerative power that Isis ha uh, has. This kind of a queen, shimmering in glory, is alas unparalleled, who transcends the material circumstances of her confinement, both within the tomb and within the body of the boy actor who performed that role. The final lines of the conquering Caesar strive in vain to compete he has this sententious com uh, couplet at the end, saying that the, the lover's story is so wonderful that no less in pity than his glory, meaning his own, which brought them to be lamented. That rings absolutely hollow at the end of the play. Caesar's soldiers may have occupied Egypt and the stage, but Cleopatra still holds the kingdom, the power, and the glory in the hearts, minds, and memories of spectators. Thank you very much. <laughs>